So, in the last class we discussed about the nature of mind in uh, the philosophy of René Descartes. Descartes as you all saw is uh, deriving a kind of a thesis which is called uh, substance dualism. As you know for Descartes mind is an independent substance and the body is another substance which is independent of the mind. So, body and mind are two independent substances and their existence does not need the help of the other uh, meaning thereby the existence of mind does not require uh, the existence of the body and the existence of body does not require the existence of mind. With this now uh, we had uh, formulated uh, Descartes uh, philosophy of mind as a substance and dualistic theory of mind. Today we will discuss little further how do we comprehend the nature of mind in the Descartes theoretical framework. Is it simply that Descartes it is deducing from this hypothesis that I think therefore, I exist or therefore, I am is it a simple axiomatic claim that Descartes is making or there is something else. What is the epistemological clue Descartes provides us to understand the nature of the mind or the nature of the self? Is there a metaphysical necessity to talk about the nature of self? What is the epistemic access to this notion of the self? That is what we would like to discuss. And at the later half of this uh, talk, I will be also talking about critiques of uh, Descartes, uh, particularly uh, Gilbert Ryle and John Searle. I have accepted them as critiques because, as you know, Gilbert Ryle's famous essay, Descartes uh, uh, Myth, is a very important contribution to the contemporary debate on philosophy of mind. And so, also it is true in the case of uh, John Searle, who is uh, talking about how mind body problem is no more a mind body problem. Whether what is mind body problem today is something like this that there is a mind brain problem. So, we will come back to these debates about the myths in uh, Cartesian philosophy, in the philosophy of Rene Descartes and why John Searle does not find that mind body dualism is not a problematic one. So, I will come back to these two questions a little later. Now, let us look at Descartes axioms that I think therefore, I am cogito ergo sum. Now, when Descartes believes that I think is an indubitable proposition, Descartes is certainly aware of uh, this fact that this indubitability is something very intuitive, something very private. Now, that is what it is Descartes is claiming. Why? Because I am a thinking um, thing is not accessible to the other. I am not an object, rather I am the subject which is thinking all the time and hence from this notion of thinking I can very well derive that I exist. So, I existence the existence of the subject as a thinking thing is something very important, important from two points of view. One is that it is a epistemic subject who is uh, all the time knowing imagining, dreaming, experiencing, feeling etcetera, etcetera and it is also a metaphysical subject. That the metaphysics of uh, the subject talks about the fact that mind is really there. It does not say that mind is something like a mystical entity which is uh, an epiphenomenon. Oh, so, that kind of claim Descartes does not want to make. And mind is represented as a kind of a unitary 
principle. Okay. When I say I am acting, I am giving this lecture. So, this I represents the entire activities of mind. So, the representation of mind as a self is something very significant in the Cartesian theory of, of mind, uh, where Descartes makes an ontological claim. So, substance dualism talks about the ontology of mind, mind that is really there and when Descartes talks about mind that is really there, it is there independent of the objects that are there in the world. So, the ontology of uh, the object or the ontology of the world is also not questioned by Descartes, because Descartes knows I mean in the sense that Descartes quite convinced with this mechanistic world view, uh, which was proposed by Galileo and many others uh, that the object or the things in the world have an ontological uh, status and their ontology is something which is clear and observable, I mean which also talks about a self evident truth. So, the ontology of the world is self evident, because it is observable, it is publicly accessible etcetera etcetera. Similarly, the ontology of the mind is also real and it exists and it is accessible from a private uh, sense, it is directly accessible meaning thereby I can directly access my mind, you do not have a direct uh, access to my mind, rather I have a direct access to mind. So, everyone who thinks have a direct access to their respective minds, um, I can immediately know that what I am thinking, I am aware of what I am thinking right now. So, that state of my mind is immediately accessible, whereas it is not immediately given to your observation. So, what you observe is probably my actions, my behaviors etcetera, etcetera, but my behaviors actions are part of the body, it is the body which is performing my behaviors, it is the body which is you know making utterances, um, it is the body which you know makes these expressions possible. But what is important for Descartes here is this that it is not the body alone is real, it is something which is presupposed here is to be looked very carefully that there is a mind which causes certain voluntary actions and my giving this lecture to you all talks about my voluntary actions. So, when you, you observe my behaviors, you are listening to my uh, lectures, now these lectures are already made public. So, there is nothing private about it, but in Cartesian framework there is some sense of privacy still prevails in the sense that how do does one know about the mind? How does one have the access to his or her mind? So, in that sense when you look at this question, you will find that there is some element of privacy is still left to Descartes and Descartes has been criticized for this notion of privacy, that mind is immediately accessible to an individual who is a thinking thing and as a thinking subject he alone is aware of what he is thinking. So, there is a kind of a inner mind, mind is not a public phenomenon, mind is not an outer phenomenon. So, this inner outer distinction is very clear in the Cartesian philosophy of mind or the Descartes philosophy of mind. Now, how does one resolve that kind of a dualism, how does one connect to these two pools, the inner pool on the one hand and the outer pool on the other hand. Now, Descartes believed that it is because of the God, it is because of the existence of God, power of omnipotence, this kind of interaction is possible between these two pools the mind and the body. When we say that the body is 
I am doing this, I am doing that, I am giving you lecture, I am listening to music, I am observing all of you in the class, I am invigilating your examinations etcetera, etcetera. I am performing voluntary actions and we all perform voluntary actions in our everyday life. When we talk about voluntary actions, human action in particular, we do not really bother about the mind body interaction. Rather, this is a very theoretical questions and indeed a very philosophical questions. It is not a general question in that sense. So, when Lily Allen N points out very recently on his text Descartes concept of mind, he says the mind body interaction is not questioned at all when we talk about our everyday life phenomena. So, it is questioned only when we talk about when mind is not interacting with the body. If that interaction is possible at all and what is Descartes response to this? Descartes said this interaction is possible because there is an omnipotence God. So, Descartes gives a kind of a religious answer to the thesis. I mean beyond these two substances mind and body Descartes in fact, you know many of the historians of uh, philosophy of mind have quoted that Descartes is presupposing another kind of a substance. The substance is probably primary substance or God that comes at the end of his you know meditations. Let us do not talk about the concept of God, I will come back to this idea when we will talk about Ryle, but let us see if mind and body are interacting then what is this mechanism of interaction. So, for example, when I came to your class I thought about what I am going to say today. Now, this thinking or deciding to talk something relevant is a kind of a decision that I am making, it is a kind of a judgment that I am making. Okay. So, I am already in conversation with my own self that I will be doing this. Now, when I am say I am already in conversation with myself, I am presupposing that there is a there is a self or I am rather talking to me. Now, Descartes says that this kind of intervention and the intervention that uh, happens from language okay, makes a kind of a confused relations, I mean in the sense that it gives a confused idea about my own being, my own self. Why this confusion? What kind of confusion it is? Now, Descartes as I mentioned earlier uh, in the previous class that Descartes is in fact interested in the kind of a knowledge claim which is clear, distinct and self evident. Now, knowledge must guarantee clarity, knowledge must guarantee that you know, it is distinct and clear, knowledge must guarantee some kind of certainty to all of us, hence it should be self evidently true. So, the intervention of language does not make uh, things clear according to Descartes, but still Descartes is a kind of you know arguing a kind of a representational thesis, where the existence of mind is presupposed. But my knowledge about my mind is such an immediate knowledge, where I do not really require the help of language to know it. Now, look at this idea of a making a decision or a judgment or saying something to you presupposes a thought or a thinking mind. For Descartes, this thinking mind is a kind of a ontological reality and this ontological reality controls all our voluntary actions. It executes these ideas, these decisions and that is how we are able to perform voluntary actions. Now, where does Descartes locate the mind? As I have mentioned earlier, I would like to repeat it here that Descartes locates the mind at the center of the pelian gland and this gland is somewhere at the middle of the brain. Now, the pineal gland is the immediately 
is a place where the soul or the mind is located. In Descartes' meditation, you will find there is no mention of mind, rather Descartes is again mentioning the concept of soul. I am using the concept of mind and the soul interchangeably. So, here it is the soul which has the power of intervening to the domain of mind and the body has the power, has the ability to sense things and pass this information to the mind. The mechanism through which this information is passed through is something very significant. Descartes says there are animal spirits and there are animal spirits stored in the cavities and these animal spirits are transformed into some kind of sensations and further by actions. So, there is a kind of a you now elaborate discussion on this biological function of the body, how the animal spirit is transformed into some kind of a behavior, okay. how this animal spirit controls our muscles. Okay. Now, how this animal spirit cause you know, voluntary actions, bodily movements. So, that is what is explained in the, the Cartesian biological or physiological framework. So, there is a complete explanation of that. Let us do not go deep into that kind of uh, questions. Let us accept in brief that the body is an uh, organic system and this organic systems is controlled certain mechanical uh, function of the organisms. Thereby, we can explain the behaviors of the body by using the mechanical laws. So, human body is like any other material body. So, like any other matter. So, that is why this mind and matter dichotomy in Descartes. Because my access to my body is like my access to the objects out there. So, as I said the body exists out there, I am not having a kind of immediate access to this particular entity as I am having in the case of the mind. So, th that is what is the something very uh, significant in Descartes. Now, the other two um, things uh, which I would like to mention in this context, context is this. One is do animals think and the other is what is the status of animal? Uh, one of the brief uh, answer to this question would be now in Descartes animals do not think. Now, why I am posing this questions in between? I am posing it because are these animals treated like any other objects in the world? The answer is yes. In, in Descartes philosophical framework we will find that animals do not think, they are like you know, the material bodies, okay. they are like trees, plants and any other uh, objects like stones etcetera, etcetera. Now, what is the capacity of, of human thinking? Now, according to Descartes, human beings are having higher order consciousness and there are two important features of this higher order consciousness is one is imagination and another is reasoning. Okay. So, imagination and reasoning are two important features of human consciousness. Human beings can imagine what would happen in future. With the help of imagination, we can grasp things. Okay. Now, you might have learned uh, something about this uh, Descartes example of the wax. Now, when Descartes talks about the objects, talks about things or the matter, material bodies, what does he says? He says the material bodies are, are having certain fundamental or essential properties and like thinking has is an essential property of consciousness or, or the mind or the soul. Similarly, the matter has an essential property and that essential property is extension. So, extension is an essential 
feature. What is essentiality here? Now, Descartes gives an example of wax. When he says, let us collect, go and collect wax from the honeycomb okay, and bring that wax. And when you bring that wax to the table and you will find the wax has particular fragrance and it has a particular color, particular shape etcetera, etcetera. But if you light the flame and bring that wax near to the flame and burn it, you will find uh, colors is changing and uh, shape is also changing. Now, what remains with that object? And Descartes says it is the extension. Extension is something that which tells us that something which occupies space. The body is an extended entity must occupy a space. So, that which occupies space is the extension of the body. So, Descartes saying that there is a kind of a res cogitans and res extensa. Res cogitans is about the existence of the mind and the mental events or mental states and processes whatever is there in the in the domain of the mental life. Res extensa talks about whatever exists in the domain of the material world. So, this kind of dichotomy uh, is very much there and the very fact that I am able to grasp it is the same wax. Descartes said it is my imagination which helps me to comprehend that it is the same wax. So, with the help of imagination and reasoning, the, I can talk about the existence of the wax or the identity of the wax. So, the, the identity of the being is captured by my imagination and rationality. Now, similarly, when I, how do I say that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 and this 2 plus 2 is equal to 3 plus 1? This kind of identity is comprehended through my reasoning and through my imagination. So, human beings have a kind of a higher order you know consciousness and this higher order consciousness is different from mere sensibility. Animals have this power of sensing things, they show us some reflexive behaviors. Look at the pet, pets are very sensible animals, I, I should say that pets are very sensible beings and what is it to you that when they you know roll tears, if you beat them, if you are being very harsh to them, what is that? Are they not thinking? Now, for Descartes they are not thinking, they are not thinking precisely because they are not aware of what they are doing. Now, this awareness for Descartes is a kind of a self awareness the awareness of one's own individuality, the awareness of one's own being is something very, very important. And it is that awareness which confirms that we are a metaphysical subject, we are a subject which exists to perform certain moral actions. So, all our voluntary actions are to be morally evaluated they are evaluated as either good or bad precisely because we are responsible for our actions. Now, this kind of a responsibility is attributed to human beings, human actions particularly because human actions flows from a conscious mind, human beings know what they are doing. We do not hold responsible to the animals when we say that they are performing voluntary actions. Of course, they uh, have some beliefs or of course, they have uh, the sense of fear, doubts etcetera, uh, quite possible. Uh, to me personally, they do we have uh, certain belief states, but what is not immediately given or what is not given at all to them is this idea of self consciousness, the existence, the consciousness about their own individuality is something very significant. Now, Descartes is uh, trying to talk about the existence of uh, one's own being with reference to introspection. He says, 
how do I understand my own individuality? How do I understand that I am the same person? Because my physical body has changed and is changing uh, or in future we all will grow up. No, but still I consider myself as the same individual. So, Descartes says introspection is something uh, which talks about how do I reflect on my own being and this reflection is a reflection of on my consciousness that is what gives me a clear and distinct ideas about my own self. This is where Descartes is uh, claiming that we can introspect, analyze the phenomenal mind, we can uh, very well study the phenomenal mind, reflect on our thoughts and see how distinctly they are appearing to all of us. So, so the existence of mind is not questioned in the Cartesian theoretical framework. Neither Descartes questions the existence of the body. The body has essential property called extension and the mind has an essential property called thinking thought. Now, with these two essential qualities or attributes, I mean Descartes has never called it properties, mind is not a property for Descartes. I am saying it probably, I still believe that mind is uh, you know, uh, caused by certain brain processes, which is the claim of John Searle. Let us conclude about uh, Descartes uh, theoretical positions. Now, Descartes for me is a dualist okay, who accepts that mind and body are independently or conceivable, their existence can be independently conceivable. Mind is a thinking um, substance, where the body is an extended substance. So, they belong to two different categories. Now, this word the category is something significant, we will come to see what kind of significance it has when we will go to the critiques of Descartes. Let us go back to the critiques of Descartes. Gilbert Ryle, one of the 20th century philosopher, raising an important point uh, with regard to Descartes substance dualism. According to Ryle, Descartes theory is an official theory. It is official because it is widely accepted. Okay. People accept it and though they find that there is some problem about the interaction between mind and body, I mean the religious thinkers, the scientists and many others, they often find that it is not a problematic one, but with some modification this position can be held. Now, Ryle calls this in one of the official theory, it is one of the established theory, but Ryle does not accept Descartes theoretical positions. I would come to some of the questions which Ryle is raising in this context. Now, let us look at these questions from the other slide. How can the mental events will be part of the physical events? Because as you know for Ryle mental events are different from physical events, mental events are private, they are accessible directly to all of us and whereas, physical events are the events which are there in the world, they are observable and therefore, mental events are not part of the physical events. Now, the question is how can the mental events will be part of the physical events? The second question talks about how does body influence the mind and vice versa. Is there an interaction between mind and body? Because we are an embodied being, we think Descartes is posing this question and as I mentioned a philosopher Lily Allenen in a, her book Descartes concept of mind published in 2003 by Harvard University Press says that Descartes is talking about an embodied being and this embodied being is a being where 
the embodiment of mind is not questioned at all in our everyday life. So, then how does uh, Descartes explain uh, to us the mind body interaction is a logical interaction. I think Rayle is raising the question because there is some amount of mysticism left there. The, the third question talks about how can we be entirely blind and deaf about the working of other mind. For they say that my mind is available to me as a person and it is private, I can take only the cognizance of its activities. So, what I am thinking right now, but how can you be not aware of all this when I am living in this world? How can you be entirely blind and deaf about the workings of other minds? Is there something hidden then? So, Riley is certainly referring to Freud who says there is something called an unconscious mind and that unconscious mind is something very much hidden to the conscious mind. So, Ryle brings Freud, Sigmund Freud, one of the 20th century famous psychoanalyst who lived in Vienna. Now, how does the last question talks about, how does one talk about the authenticity? Now, when we talk about the objectivity of mind, it is very important that how do I make conform this objectivity? How do I conform that this is something very significant? This is something really there and because that makes my claim very circular in the sense that I know that I am and I know that I am thinking being. So, my thinking defines or explains my existence to me and I will not have any kind of a clue on the basis of which I can confirm that others are thinking. So, in that sense this question is something very interesting. Now, Descartes says that mind and body are two independent substances, mind is an inner phenomenon and it is real, it does not exist in space. Whereas, body is uh, something which exists in space. Now, the existence of mind in the body, taken the case of an embodied mind, okay, mind that is there in the body and you know, performing voluntary actions or experiencing performing things. So, that mind Ryle says I mean is this a mind like a ghost, ghost in the machine is you know is something Ryle's uh, one of the favorite uh, concept. According to Ryle mind exists in the body like the ghost exists in the brain in or the on the machine. So, the human body is like a machine okay, and it is functioning following the natural laws, the law of causalities. So, the, the mechanical laws can explain how does the body function. So, but mechanical law would not explain how my body acts according to my will, my intention to act. So, the mechanical action does not explain the mind, because mind is something outside uh, there. The, look at Ryle's favorite example of uh, ghost in the machine, where he says, how can we locate an university? Okay. Now, a foreigner visiting an university, I will just read out this quotation. It has then to be explained to him that the university is not another collateral institution, some ulterior counterpart to the colleges, laboratories and offices, which he has seen. The university is just the way in which all that is already seen is organized. Now, this is very important in the sense that he says, when we talk about mind, mind is nothing but a kind of a collateral you know, organic bodies, which are there. 
Okay. So, mind exists, mind cannot exist independent of the body. Like when a foreigner visits to a university, he would find that there are departments, there are schools, there are laboratories, libraries, there are gymnasiums. Now, he would see all this. Now, where does the university exist? When you say that there it exists when we put all this thing uh, together, it is a kind of a collateral institutions where the ulterior counterpart is the university. So, when you say that mind and body are two different things, then you are really making a category mistake. So, according to Ryle, they are not two categorically independent substances, they are one and that can be you know analyzed. Ryle gives various examples, one is how we can talk about a system okay, and how we can uh, look at you now there are different divisions within the systems. I mean say there is a system and there are subsystems and how the subsystems are functioning. So, th that is important and once you know the function of the subsystems, you will understand how the entire system is functioning. So, that is one, one kind of example when he tried to give how pointing out to the parades of uh, the military and he also talks about team spirit. What is this concept called team spirit? Pointing out to a cricket match. In a cricket match, the bowlers are bowling to the batsmen, batsmen do face the balls, they bet well go for 6, 4, singles etcetera. There is a case of a run out, there is a case of bold. Now, all these are the concepts when you talk about a cricket match happening out there. But where do we locate this concept of team spirit when the entire team is very enthusiastically playing the cricket, okay, trying to defeat the other. Okay. So, team spirit is part of everybody, uh, it is not with the bowlers, it is not with the fielders, it is not with the captain, it is exhibited, now quote in quote, Riles talk, it is exhibited in the performance of everyone's actions. So, it is not something hidden. So, mind is similarly uh, is exhibited when we perform voluntary actions, mind is not something hidden. So, there is nothing called private about this concept of mind. There is another thing which Ryle makes it very clear to all of us. Now, what are the reasons why Descartes concludes the substance dualism? What are the reasons? behind it. Now, look at this, the origin of this category mistake. And Descartes was very much you know, aware of Galileo's mechanical theory of the universe. Okay. Now, the, the mechanical theory of universe talks about there is a mechanical law, there is a causal law which pervades everything and that can explain the nature of things that are uh, existing in the world or the existing in the universe. But Descartes was bit uncomfortable when it comes to the explanation of the mind. Descartes showed that there is something beyond the mechanical function of the universe. Now, Ryle is also referring to Hobbes. Hobbes did not much bother about the existence of mind, rather he was quite comfortable with Galileo's mechanical theory. Now, mechanical theory is explained by Galileo with an example of a clock, how the machineries in the clock function. When you look at the wheels of the, of the clock, they are all connected with each other. So, like you know, as I mentioned earlier uh, that there are subsystems and subsystems are having a kind of a coordinated function okay, and that exhibits that a system is functioning. So, in a mechanistic world view, you will find that mind is part of the world and Hobbes 
accepts this uh, world view, Hobbes is committed uh, to this world view, but uh, Descartes is not. Descartes had this religious and moral feeling which was the reason probably for not feeling comfortable uh, with this mechanistic world view. Descartes saw that mind is uh, something which cannot be explained with the mechanical laws, the law of the universe. And these are the, uh, I think, mind is not governed by a non-mechanical uh, laws. Now, the question is whether mind is governed by a non-mechanical laws at all. The later Cartesians have this view that mind is governed by a kind of a non-mechanical laws, like you have a kind of a Leibniz idea of a universal the law of reasons, where you know principles which governs our actions, which are different from the causal uh, laws. One can look at Leibniz world and um, look at see whether things are um, there. The other problem which we find is this that the reason for a category mistake is that how do we relate freedom of will with a deterministic world, because the universe which is uh, governed by the mechanistic principles or the principle of law of causality is gives a kind of a closure in the sense that or puts a kind of a closure to the entire system and that is a kind of a, you know a determinism which Descartes is contemplating and how does one explain freedom with relation to the determinism. So, these are the questions which we will come back to in our next classes maybe in the future I will we have a special topic on the freedom of will and there we will be discussing the relationship between free will and, and the world um, or when we will talk about cells we will try to see how cell tries to uh, define this relationship those are the questions. So, to conclude uh, this so Descartes is a substance dualist and mind as a substance can be immediately known one can have a privileged access to the mind through introspection and similarly on the other hand we will find that the body is an extended uh, entity and extension is the essential feature of the body and that exist and the functions of the body can be explained through the mechanical principles of the universe and Ryle is being a very much critique to this you know, idea of uh, dualism and according to Ryle this is a category mistake. So, mind is not an entity which exists independent of the body, mind is you say that then it is like a ghost existing. So, the, the presence of mind is is an epiphenomenon for Ryle, but probably Ryle is will not say that Ryle accepts that there is mind, but in Ryle's philosophical analysis you will find that Ryle accepts that the mind is rather exhibited in the behaviors in in our voluntary actions. So, Ryle does not really eliminate the notion of mind when he identifies mind with the behaviors or voluntary actions. So, with this I will end this lecture and uh, we will come back to Searle's criticism in the next lecture and see how does Searle uh, do justice to Descartes substance dualism. Thank you.